The Desire of Ages, Chapter 67 Woes on the Pharisees It was the last day of Christ's teaching in the temple. Of the vast throngs that were gathered at Jerusalem, the attention of all had been attracted to him. The people had crowded the temple courts, watching the contest that had been in progress, and they eagerly caught every word that fell from his lips. Never before had such a scene been witnessed. There stood the young Galilean, bearing no earthly honor or royal badge. Surrounding him were priests in their rich apparel, rulers with robes and badges significant of their exalted station, and scribes with scrolls in their hands to which they made frequent reference. Jesus stood calmly before them with the dignity of a king. As one invested with the authority of heaven, he looked unflinchingly upon his adversaries who had rejected and despised his teachings and who thirsted for his life. They had assailed him in great numbers, but their schemes to ensnare and condemn him had been in vain. Challenge after challenge he had met, presenting the pure, bright truth in contrast to the darkness and errors of the priests and Pharisees. He had set before these leaders their real condition and the retribution sure to follow persistence in their evil deeds. The warning had been faithfully given. Yet another work remained for Christ to do. Another purpose was still to be accomplished. The interest of the people in Christ and his work had steadily increased. They were charmed with his teachings, but they were also greatly perplexed. They had respected the priests and rabbis for their intelligence and apparent piety. In all religious matters, they had ever yielded implicit obedience to their authority. Yet they now saw these men trying to cast discredit upon Jesus, a teacher whose virtue and knowledge shone forth the brighter from every assault. They looked upon the lowering countenances of the priests and elders and there saw discomfiture and confusion. They marveled that the rulers would not believe on Jesus when his teachings were so plain and simple. They themselves knew not what course to take. With eager anxiety they watched the movements of those whose counsels they had always followed. In the parables which Christ had spoken, it was his purpose both to warn the rulers and to instruct the people who were willing to be taught, but there was need to speak yet more plainly. Through their reverence for tradition and their blind faith in a corrupt priesthood, the people were enslaved. These chains Christ must break. The character of the priests, rulers and Pharisees must be more fully exposed. The scribes and the Pharisees, he said, sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say, and do not. The scribes and Pharisees claim to be invested with divine authority similar to that of Moses. They assumed to take his place as expounders of the law and judges of the people. As such, they claimed from the people the utmost deference and obedience. Jesus bade his hearers do that which the rabbis taught according to the law, but not to follow their example. They themselves did not practice their own teaching. And they taught much that was contrary to the scriptures. Jesus said, They bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. The Pharisees enjoined a multitude of regulations, having their foundation in tradition and unreasonably restricting personal liberty. And certain portions of the law they so explained as to impose upon the people observances which they themselves secretly ignored, and from which, when it served their purpose, they actually claimed exemption. To make a show of their piety was their constant aim. Nothing was held too sacred to serve this end. To Moses God had said concerning his commandments, Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. These words have a deep meaning. As the word of God is meditated upon and practiced, the whole man will be ennobled. 
In righteous and merciful dealing, the hands will reveal as a signet the principles of God's law. They will be kept clean from bribes and from all that is corrupt and deceptive. They will be active in works of love and compassion. The eyes directed toward a noble purpose will be clear and true. The expressive countenance, the speaking eye, will testify to the blameless character of him who loves and honors the word of God. But by the Jews of Christ's day, all this was undiscerned. The command given to Moses was construed into a direction that the precepts of Scripture should be worn upon the person. They were accordingly written upon strips of parchment and bound in a conspicuous manner about the heads and wrists. But this did not cause the law of God to take a firmer hold of the mind and heart. These parchments were worn merely as badges to attract attention. They were thought to give the wearers an air of devotion which would command the reverence of the people. Jesus struck a blow at this vain pretense. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called master, for one is your master, even Christ. In such plain words the Saviour revealed the selfish ambition that was ever reaching for place and power, displaying a mock humility, while the heart was filled with avarice and envy. When persons were invited to a feast, the guests were seated according to their rank, and those who were given the most honourable place received the first attention and special favours. The Pharisees were ever scheming to secure these honours. This practice Jesus rebuked. He also reproved the vanity shown in coveting the title of rabbi or master. Such a title, he declared, belonged not to men, but to Christ. Priests, scribes and rulers, expounders and administrators of the law were all brethren, children of one father. Jesus impressed upon the people that they were to give no man a title of honour indicating his control of their conscience or their faith. If Christ were on earth today, surrounded by those who bear the title of reverend or right reverend, would he not repeat his saying, Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. The scripture declares of God, holy and reverend is his name. To what human being is such a title befitting? How little does man reveal of the wisdom and righteousness it indicates? How many of those who assume this title are misrepresenting the name and character of God? Alas, how often have worldly ambition, despotism, and the basest sins been hidden under the broidered garments of a high and holy office? The Saviour continued, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Again and again Christ had taught that true greatness is measured by moral worth. In the estimation of heaven, greatness of character consists in living for the welfare of our fellow men, in doing works of love and mercy. Christ, the King of glory, was a servant to fallen man. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, said Jesus. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. By perverting the scriptures, the priests and lawyers blinded the minds of those who would otherwise have received a knowledge of Christ's kingdom. And that inward divine life which is essential to true holiness. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. 
The Pharisees had great influence with the people, and of this they took advantage to serve their own interests. They gained the confidence of pious widows and then represented it as a duty for them to devote their property to religious purposes. Having secured control of their money, the wily schemers used it for their own benefit. To cover their dishonesty, they offered long prayers in public and made a great show of piety. This hypocrisy, Christ declared, would bring them the greater damnation. The same rebuke falls upon many in our day who make a high profession of piety. Their lives are stained by selfishness and avarice, yet they throw over it all a garment of seeming purity and thus for a time deceive their fellow men. But they cannot deceive God. He reads every purpose of the heart and will judge every man according to his deeds. Christ unsparingly condemned abuses, but he was careful not to lessen obligation. He rebuked the selfishness that extorted and misapplied the widow's gifts. At the same time, he commended the widow who brought her offering for God's treasury. Man's abuse of the gift could not turn God's blessing from the giver. Jesus was in the court where were the treasure chests, and he watched those who came to deposit their gifts. Many of the rich brought large sums, which they presented with great ostentation. Jesus looked upon them sadly, but made no comment on their liberal offerings. Presently his countenance lighted, as he saw a poor widow approach hesitantly, as though fearful of being observed. As the rich and haughty swept by to deposit their offerings, she shrank back as if hardly daring to venture further. And yet she longed to do something, little though it might be for the cause she loved. She looked at the gift in her hand. It was very small in comparison with the gifts of those around her, yet it was her all. Watching her opportunity, she hurriedly threw in her two mites and turned to hasten away. But in doing this, she caught the eye of Jesus, which was fastened earnestly upon her. The Saviour called his disciples to him and bade them mark the widow's poverty. Then his words of commendation fell upon her ear. Of a truth, I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast in more than they all. Tears of joy filled her eyes as she felt that her act was understood and appreciated. Many would have advised her to keep her pittance for her own use. Given into the hands of the well-fed priests, it would be lost sight of among the many costly gifts brought to the treasury. But Jesus understood her motive. She believed the service of the temple to be of God's appointment, and she was anxious to do her utmost to sustain it. She did what she could and her act was to be a monument to her memory through all time and her joy in eternity. Her heart went with her gift. Its value was estimated not by the worth of the coin, but by the love to God and the interest in his work that had prompted the deed. Jesus said of the poor widow, She hath cast in more than they all. The rich had bestowed from their abundance many of them to be seen and honoured by men. Their large donations had deprived them of no comfort or even luxury. They had required no sacrifice and could not be compared in value with the widow's might. It is the motive that gives character to our acts, stamping them with ignominy or with high moral worth. Not the great things which every eye sees and every tongue praises does God account most precious. The little duties cheerfully done, the little gifts which make no show and to which human eyes may appear worthless, often stand highest in his sight. A heart of faith and love is dearer to God than the most costly gift. The poor widow gave her living to do the little that she did. She deprived herself of food in order to give those two mites to the cause she loved. And she did it in faith, believing that her heavenly Father would not overlook her great need. It was this unselfish spirit and childlike faith that won the Saviour's commendation. 
Among the poor there are many who long to show their gratitude to God for His grace and truth. They greatly desire to share with their more prosperous brethren in sustaining His service. These souls should not be repulsed. Let them lay up their mites in the bank of heaven. If given from a heart filled with love for God, these seeming trifles become consecrated gifts, priceless offerings, which God smiles upon and blesses. When Jesus said of the widow, She hath cast in more than they all, his words were true, not only of the motive, but the results of her gift. The two mites which make a farthing have brought to God's treasury an amount of money far greater than the contributions of those rich Jews. The influence of that little gift has been like a stream, small in its beginning, but widening and deepening as it flowed down through the ages. In a thousand ways, it has contributed to the relief of the poor and the spread of the gospel. Her example of self-sacrifice has acted and reacted upon thousands of hearts in every land and in every age. It has appealed to both the rich and the poor, and their offerings have swelled the value of her gift. God's blessing upon the widow's might has made it the source of great results. So with every gift bestowed and every act performed with a sincere desire for God's glory, it is linked with the purpose of omnipotence. Its results for good no man can measure. The Saviour continued his denunciations of the scribes and Pharisees. Woe unto you, ye blind guides, which say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple, it is nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he is a debtor. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifieth the gold? And whosoever shall swear by the altar, it is nothing, but whosoever sweareth by the gift that is upon it, he is guilty. Ye fools and blind, for whither is greater, the gift or the altar that sanctifieth the gift? The priests interpreted God's requirements according to their own false and narrow standard. They presumed to make nice distinctions as to the comparative guilt of various sins, passing over some lightly and treating others of perhaps less consequence as unpardonable. For a money consideration, they excused persons from their vows, and for large sums of money, they sometimes passed over aggravated crimes. At the same time, these priests and rulers would in other cases pronounce severe judgment for trivial offences. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. In these words, Christ again condemns the abuse of sacred obligation. The obligation itself he does not set aside. The tithing system was ordained by God, and it had been observed from the earliest times. Abraham, the father of the faithful, paid tithes of all that he possessed. The Jewish rulers recognized the obligation of tithing, and this was right but they did not leave the people to carry out their own conviction of duty. Arbitrary rules were laid down for every case. The requirements had become so complicated that it was impossible for them to be fulfilled. None knew when their obligations were met. As God gave it, the system was just and reasonable, but the priests and rabbis had made it a wearisome burden. All that God commands is of consequence. Christ recognized the payment of tithes as a duty, but he showed that this could not excuse the neglect of other duties. The Pharisees were very exact in tithing garden herbs, such as mint, anise, and rue. This cost them little, and it gave them a reputation for exactness and sanctity. At the same time, their useless restrictions oppressed the people and destroyed respect for the sacred system of God's own appointing. They occupied men's minds with trifling distinctions and turned their attention from essential truths. The weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy and truth, 
were neglected. These, Christ said, ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Other laws had been perverted by the rabbis in like manner. In the directions given through Moses, it was forbidden to eat any unclean thing. The use of swine's flesh and the flesh of certain other animals was prohibited, as likely to fill the blood with impurities and to shorten life. But the Pharisees did not leave these restrictions as God had given them. They went to unwarranted extremes. Among other things, the people were required to strain all the water used, lest it should contain the smallest insect which might be classed with the unclean animals. Jesus contrasting these trivial exactions with the magnitude of their actual sins said to the Pharisees, Ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. As the whitened, beautiful, decorated tomb concealed the putrefying remains within, So the outward holiness of the priests and rulers concealed iniquity. Jesus continued, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because ye build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchres of the righteous and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore ye be witnesses unto yourselves, that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. To show their esteem for the dead prophets, the Jews were very zealous in beautifying their tombs, but they did not profit by their teachings, nor give heed to their reproofs. In the days of Christ, a superstitious regard was cherished for the resting places of the dead, and vast sums of money were lavished upon their decoration. In the sight of God, this was idolatry. In their undue regard for the dead, men showed that they did not love God supremely, nor their neighbor as themselves. The same idolatry is carried to great lengths today. Many are guilty of neglecting the widow and the fatherless, the sick and the poor, in order to build expensive monuments for the dead. Time, money, and labor are freely spent for this purpose while duties to the living, duties to which Christ has plainly enjoined, are left undone. The Pharisees built the tombs of the prophets and adorned their sepulchres and said one to another, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have united with them in shedding the blood of God's servants. At the same time, they were planning to take the life of his son. This should be a lesson to us. It should open our eyes to the power of Satan to deceive the mind that turns from the light of truth. Many follow in the track of the Pharisees. They revere those who have died for their faith. They wonder at the blindness of the Jews in rejecting Christ. Had we lived in his day, they declared, we would gladly have received his teaching. We would never have been partakers in the guilt of those who rejected the Saviour. But when obedience to God requires self-denial and humiliation, these very persons stifle their convictions and refuse obedience. Thus they manifest the same spirit as did the Pharisees whom Christ condemned. Little did the Jews realize the terrible responsibility involved in rejecting Christ. From the time when the first innocent blood was shed, when righteous Abel fell by the hand of Cain, the same history had been repeated with increasing guilt. In every age, prophets had lifted up their voices against the sins of kings, rulers, and people, speaking the words which God gave them and obeying His will at the peril of their lives. From generation to generation, there had been heaping up of a terrible punishment for the rejectors of light and truth. This the enemies of Christ were now drawing down upon their own heads. The sin of the priests and rulers was greater than that of any preceding generation. 
by their rejection of the Savior, they were making themselves responsible for the blood of all the righteous men slain from Abel to Christ. They were about to fill to overflowing their cup of iniquity, and soon it was to be poured upon their heads in retributive justice. Of this Jesus warned them, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth. From the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Bacarius, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. The scribes and Pharisees who listened to Jesus knew that his words were true. They knew how the prophet Zacharias had been slain. While the words of warning from God were upon his lips, a satanic fury seized upon the apostate king, and at his command the prophet was put to death. His blood had imprinted itself upon the very stones of the temple court and could not be erased. It remained to bear testimony against apostate Israel. As long as the temple should stand, there would be the stain of that righteous blood crying to God to be avenged. As Jesus referred to these fearful sins, a thrill of horror ran through the multitude. Looking forward, Jesus declared that the impenitence of the Jews and their intolerance of God's servants would be the same in the future as it had been in the past. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Prophets and wise men, full of faith and the Holy Ghost, Stephen, James, and many others would be condemned and slain. With hand uplifted to heaven and a divine light enshrouding his person, Christ spoke as a judge to those before him. His voice that had so often been heard in gentleness and entreaty was now heard in rebuke and condemnation. The listeners shuddered. Never was the impression made by his words and his look to be effaced. Christ's indignation was directed against the hypocrisy, the gross sins by which men were destroying their own souls, deceiving the people and dishonoring God. In the specious, deceptive reasoning of the priests and rulers, he discerned the working of satanic agencies. Keen and searching had been his denunciation of sin, but he spoke no words of retaliation. He had a holy wrath against the prince of darkness, but he manifested no irritated temper. So the Christian who lives in harmony with God, possessing the sweet attributes of love and mercy, will feel a righteous indignation against sin, but he will not be roused by passion to revile those who revile him. Even in meeting those who are moved by a power from beneath to maintain falsehood, in Christ he will still preserve calmness and possession. Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon his hearers. In a voice choked by deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. This is the separation struggle. In the lamentation of Christ, the very heart of God is pouring itself forth. It is the mysterious farewell of the long-suffering love of the deity. Pharisees and Sadducees were alike silenced. Jesus summoned his disciples and prepared to leave the temple, not as one defeated and forced from the presence of his adversaries, but as one whose work was accomplished. He retired a victor from the contest. The gems of truth that fell from Christ's lips on that eventful day were treasured in many hearts. For them new thoughts started into life, new aspirations were awakened, and a new history began. 
After the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, these persons came to the front and fulfilled their divine commission with a wisdom and zeal corresponding to the greatness of the work. They bore a message that appealed to the hearts of men, weakening the old superstitions that had long dwarfed the lives of thousands. Before their testimony, human theories and philosophies became as idle fables. Mighty were the results flowing from the words of the Savior to that wandering, awestruck crowd in the temple at Jerusalem. But Israel, as a nation, had divorced herself from God. The natural branches of the olive tree were broken off. Looking for the last time upon the interior of the temple, Jesus said with mournful pathos, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, ye shall not see me henceforth, till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hitherto he had called the temple his father's house, but now as the Son of God should pass out from those walls, God's presence would be withdrawn forever from the temple built to his glory. Henceforth its ceremonies would be meaningless, its services a mockery.